In 1977, the first three mass-produced computers hit the market, the TRS-80, the Commodore PET, and the Apple II. Although it was in 1977, I didn't know anything about computers other than seeing them in magazines and on science fiction films all the way until about 1979. That's when my parents brought home a Commodore PET, and that forever changed my life. I was so excited. There was nothing like it. You could actually program on the computer. Um, I'd never even seen a computer other than a mainframe with a teletype uh, at my father's office prior. And uh, we immediately started looking and programming and learning what we could do on them. So the Commodore PET that we had had 8K of memory. 8K, that's enough for maybe two pages of typewritten text. And... All the computers at that time were very limited on memory storage. The Commodore PET had a built-in tape cassette player where you could load and save your programs, and you could find magazines with programs in them and type them in. Of course, we did as kids, and it was so exciting to put these new programs in, that sort of thing. But what really made me want to program was a game called Dungeon, and it was released in 1979. I was an avid Dungeons & Dragons player at the time, and seeing a game that, and this is pre-Rogue, Dungeon was made pre-Rogue, I've got the cassette for it right here. What made me even think to find a Commodore Pet in the first place and restore it? Well, I was talking with some friends online and we were all reminiscing about where we started our programming careers or what ignited us to become programmers in the first place. And I started thinking about the Commodore PET. And so the first thing I did was look on eBay and I found that the prices were very expensive for fully restored Commodore PETs and that wasn't something I wanted to pursue. So I found an old, non-working, rusty Commodore PET, and I was thinking of just using, like, the future was 8 bits hardware and interfacing it with a non-operational Commodore PET to make it appear as if the entire thing were operational. The kind of using a new motherboard with old technology to make an operational PET just so that I could play with it, see what, where I started, basically. I found this Commodore PET, and it was very rusty. It had roots growing into the monitor. It was under a high humidity environment, so I'm guessing it was stored outside in a shed or something like that. And I started working on the restoration, and thanks to guides from 8-Bit Guy and Adrian's Digital Basement, I started working on trying to get this thing operational. And it was a long endeavor. I didn't even attempt to power this thing up because I was afraid, with, especially with all the dust, there was baked dust in it, which meant that simply using a air compressor and trying to blow it off, blew off nothing. It was chemically bonded with the actual motherboard and that sort of thing. I started going through these guides. There was an excellent one for a perfect restoration of Commodore Pet by the Bite Attic. I followed his guide very closely and used a lot of similar ideas to what he had as well. There was two modifications I made to the Commodore Pet. The first was is I actually glued heat sinks onto the vintage chips to extend their lifetime. Who knows how long these original old chips that are no longer manufactured uh, are going to last. I also glued heat sinks onto the ROMs. And, and this is following the bite attic with, with what he did. I had a heck of a time getting the cassette player to work. You know, I ended up having to chemically wash the, the motherboard and use a toothbrush on it. 
I think it was 97% pure isopropyl alcohol. There was lots of steps. The second modification that I made for it was to remove the dot when you power off the monitor. And that's to extend the lifetime of this vintage technology. When it actually powered up and worked, I was blown away. I never expected it to actually operate. In fact, I did order the Future was 8 bits hardware motherboard because I never expected to get this actual motherboard working. The end result is, is now I've got two Commodore PETs, one that is a old vintage that you see here, and then I have another Commodore PET that's built around that newer motherboard. I ended up uh, getting an acrylic case following 8-bit guy's guide for the acrylic case, and I believe that's made by its uh, Dogfish Dimensional Concepts. Ick worked with me continuously through the process of, of making my acrylic uh, case, and, uh, and I certainly appreciate it. And the end result is here. So this is my acrylic Commodore PET, and I do a lot of testing with it, especially with it, and it's a, a 32K Commodore PET, and there's dip settings for me to actually change what ROM I want to use and that sort of thing, so I can test all kinds of configuration, much more than my vintage Commodore PET, which has only ROM 1. I've got the cassette for it right here. Let me go ahead and get this preloading. So, it takes a little bit of time to load, but nothing compared to a PS5, for example, when you're installing a Blu-ray game, that sort of thing. It takes just as long, if not longer. So this, this game, Dungeon, definitely inspired me to be a programmer. It had a lot of peaks and pokes in it, which meant that there was no way that I could figure out how to actually, uh, how this game worked. And so I started looking and scouring through game manual, or I'm sorry, uh, I started scouring over manuals in BASIC so that I could learn every aspect of programming and uh, uh, covered arrays and all that wonderful stuff. And there was a limitation that my brother and I could not solve. And that was how to cursor to a specific position on the screen so that you could display what you want to display. For example, placing a character right here on the screen and right here on the screen. We could cursor to those specific places, but we couldn't figure out how to efficiently do it without running out of memory. Uh, and of course, the answer to this is a simple for a loop for your X coordinate position and a simple for a loop for your Y position. And we could not figure that out. Meantime, I kept reading more and more manuals and that sort of thing, and I became a master of pretty much every aspect of programming as, as a kid. Uh, and I knew everything about BASIC. Then one uh, day, my father invited over a fairly competent programmer, adult, and I asked him the very question of how to do that. And he showed me the unbelievable, let me get this game started. So it takes one minute to get set up. And while that's getting set up, I'll finish this. So he showed me the simple way to, to loop through and go to a specific X and Y position. And that pretty much was the keys to the kingdom for me. After that, I could program anything in BASIC that I wanted to. There was nothing I couldn't do. And that led to some jobs for me when I was in high school. And I started programming for the university, and I was able to do all kinds of stuff. I wrote my dad an amortization program so that he could see how what his payments were for the house and that sort of thing. And it really unlocked my entire career. In high school, I started learning assembly language, which was pretty much the holy grail. 
And it looks like this game is about loading, uh, done loading. It's got five seconds there. So I'm going to show you how this game works. Okay, so there I am on this little black circle here. And this is the area I can see and I can walk around. I'm going to just go with a zigzag pattern here. And if, as you notice, there's a little bit of snow that occurs as I walk. Oh, it's a spider with 24 hit points compared to my 49. So I know I can probably beat him. So I'm going to go ahead and attack him. And the spider is dead. My hit points has been raised. I have 99 hit points now. This blew our mind, especially with me being an avid D&D player. I love this game, and as you see, I'm just going to go and notice it isn't that fast of a game either. This is all written in basic. It uses lots of peeks and pokes. Oh, there's gold near. I found one gold pieces. And a snake with 100 hit points is near. Let me go ahead and attack that. That's got more health than me. And attack! The snake has 18 hit points. Looks like I'm going to beat him. The snake is dead. Okay, and at this point, you get the idea of the gameplay. So let me go ahead and quit out. So I press Q. And normally, if you die, it reveals the entire map so that you see what's left. And so there's a dragon here, a couple of other monsters, a lot more gold. And there's some rooms that you can't get to. And the secret to getting those is by pressing shift key allows you to go through walls at the expense of a little bit of your health. This game was written in assembly language in 1978, and it's a tunnel vision and cat and mouse type game. I'll show the 3D version or simulated 3D. And keep in mind at the time this was groundbreaking and very exciting to, to uh, see. Notice they show how you can see a branch in 3D versus a left branch dead end and tunnel ahead. Con you know, it just continues for indefinite amount of time. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on automatic display of the maze location just so that you can see how this works. And it shows left and right and I for instructions. So I'm going to go ahead and enter. And we're going to look down. Okay, so we've got a right hallway here with, that's a dead end. And I can continue down this hall. And notice that we are getting the snow. And it's much more rapid than when we saw snow in Dungeon. And the reason is, is because this is an assembler and it's updating much, much larger portions of the screen at once. You'll see snow similar to this, if not more, when we get into my game development. As I've continued here, you can notice that it's got a map that is displayed here of places I've been. And again, at the time, this was absolutely amazing. Uh, but this is certainly not a full adventure. In fact, there is no monsters in this. You're just trying to find the exit when you're in 3D mode. And then when you're playing in cat and mouse, it's a two-dimensional map like this. In fact, I'll show you. So I just quit and it shows me the whole way that I could have gotten to the exit. And I'm going to say yes, same maze. And this time I'm going to do cat and mouse. And now you can see that the cat is coming to find me and I'm the mouse there. I navigate through this and that sort of thing. And eventually the cat's going to find me and the whole goal is to, to get out of the game. So you're getting an idea for the complexity. Uh, this was exciting stuff. Don't get me wrong. This was not poor programming or anything. It was groundbreaking for its day. Okay, the reason why I was able to make a game so complex is because of all the foreknowledge of all the years that have passed since this 8K machine came out. And believe me, it was very tough for me to program all of that code into the game so that I could even get everything I wanted in the game working. Audio is one of the last things I put in, and I didn't even think I'd be able to get it to fit where, where there would be audio in the game. In 1979, assembly language or machine language, of course, was 
just way too far out of reach. I was a young programmer. I was just learning how to program in BASIC and mastering BASIC. And that was just impossible. When I looked at assembly language, it was kind of like looking at magic. How did they do that? It's impossible, that sort of thing. So about three months ago, I decided I wanted to program an 8K game on the pet as a tribute to Dungeon. And in 1981, on the Apple II, I had programmed a game that was kind of a tribute to this, but, but more advanced, called Explorer. And it was written in BASIC, and it required 64K. So I wanted to use my BASIC program and my data. I actually have maps that I captured from my uh, uh, work in 1981. And I wanted to port that over to the PET and see if I could get an assembly language version working on the PET with only 8K. So moving a 64K program on an Apple II over to the Commodore PET, writing the whole thing in assembly language, and seeing if it could work and actually be fun and a game, obviously, it's a simpler version of something like, uh, say, Ultima or uh, Secret of Mana, which were, of course, uh, much further in the future. And I think Ultima 1 had a restriction of, uh, it required 48K of memory. So these games are a lot more advanced, of course, but I wanted to build something that made any game from this era on an 8K machine look like child's play. So... The first thing I had to figure out was, well, could I still even program an assembly language? It had been probably since 1990 since I had looked at assembly language last, uh, specifically 6502 assembler, which the PET is written in. So my first task was to work on a multiply routine. And that I didn't want to look online how to write a multiply routine. Keep in mind that on the 6502 assembler, you're, you have three variable registers, A, X, and Y. You can only add and subtract on the A register. You can increment and decrement on the X and Y only. Okay, there is no multiply. You can also do rotations on your A register only. So you can make a multiplication routine, and so that's where I wanted to start. Rather than looking online, I wanted to work on my foreknowledge. My first attempt at doing this was at night, and I worked several hours on it, and I could not remember how to do it. It was just beyond me. It had been too long since I worked in assembly. But when I woke up in the morning, it was a different story. I wrote the, the, uh, the routine, the multiply routine, in about, I would say, 10 minutes. And that was past me, and from that point on, I started working with writing this game in assembly language. And it was quite an endeavor. The biggest challenge, of course, was making the whole thing fit in only 8K. I scoured through manuals on assembly language and working with the PET and ROM routines and that sort of thing. Originally, I wanted the uh, four levels that I had restored from the Apple II to all load in or be in memory when the game loaded, but that was an impossibility due to the memory constraints. And that made the game a lot more complicated because that meant I had to load these additional levels off of tape cassette, which meant I had to do more research to find out how to load and save on all the various Commodore pets that are out there. Specifically, what they refer to it as ROM 1, ROM 2, and ROM 4 pet. Uh, I wanted to make sure it worked on all three. I was able to recover and find a manual for the Commodore PET, and this was indispensable for programming the game, as well as a few things that I found on the archive pages of original manuals that were then restored, so I could I could review those and, and learn the, the inner details. Also, just great resources online uh, for how to perform audio and that sort of thing. So searching for an assembler, I chose CA65. There's excellent documentation online. As you can see here, I was able to easily get everything and complex features that I wanted when building my assembly language. This thing was great. I had no issues with getting 
a CA65 to do exactly what I needed for programming this game. Uh, great assembler. So the first task at hand was to recover my maps from 1981. Now keep in mind I was still a learning programmer at this point. I was fairly masterful of basic, but I decided to make my 64K game in low resolution graphics with all the updates at the bottom. Unfortunately, the game itself does not load anymore, but all the files, including the maps and the monsters, do. And I've got this uh, program here. Um, the game, the name isn't intuitive, but saving low four will load the actual map. So I'm gonna go ahead and load level one. And we'll look at what level one looks like. This again is using low resolution graphics. Notice it is written in basic, so the speed is fairly slow. The backdrop or the hallways and the rooms are in that reddish color. Monsters are orange, yellow is gold, the brown is areas that monsters cannot pass. Uh, and the pink is secret doors. Now, if you're going to try this game out, this kind of gives away quite a bit of level one, but this isn't where the plot gets really big, so I'm not too concerned about it. This was level one, all the four levels that were put in or put this way. I had to change about, I would say, I don't know, somewhere around uh, 10 to 15% I had to modify due to either compatibility issues and also... In my assembly language new version, I've made it much more robust than this one. It has all kinds of additional features like quests, multiple monsters being able to be active at once, both armor and weapons. The original Apple II game only had weapon upgrades. And just there's all kinds of various improvements in the actual engine design. I do not know how I got all this to work in 8K except to tell you that it was a constant battle. If I, for, for example, the last feature I put in was the map, and it took roughly two hours to program the map function in, and then it took two days to free up enough memory for the map to actual work. So this is the map. Obviously, to, to run something like this on the pet, this is a 40 by 40 map. If I were to do it byte for byte, this would be a ridiculous amount of memory and wouldn't fit. So when I converted it, I made a program to actually uh, reduce this down uh, so that it would fit compressed on the Commodore pet. The only level that I modified and I cut out about 25% of it was level 3, and that was to create an area in the northwest quadrant that uh, supported the new quest line that I put in. So then I wrote, keeping with the vintage theme, I wrote a quick conversion program in C to convert my level from the Apple II format, which was quite large, into the final format that would be used by the Commodore PET program. And so basically I just do a convert like that. I tell the level and it spits out some attributes just so that I know the density of various tiles and uh, that's used by the Commodore PET game. Okay, and then so I had a simple monster uh, checker program. Let's see, so I do a run of monster checker. And let's go ahead and load some of these monsters from level one just so that you get an idea of the type of information that I had. And keep in mind, all this was written when I was a boy in 1981. So I've got an orc here as armor class. Now I adjusted all this. A lot of this was directly from Dungeons and Dragons. You've got your attack there. The PR has to do with its uh, loot capabilities, uh, the number of monsters appearing, his four attacks that he can have up to. And I just keep going through it. So yes, these were modified. I got rid of the dedication to Dungeons and Dragons there and made these attributes so that they're 
exclusive. So there was some modification for the armor class and the attack values and that sort of thing. Especially with it going to assembly language because I wanted it to play nicer with my actual new code base. So the game is loading and what I did is I started by creating a bootloader and it basically has your splash screen and then some instructions for how to play. This saves memory, especially with only having 8K for the actual game. And so one of my goals with building this game was to see if I could get a fully functional operating game where you had weapons upgrades, you had an offhand weapon, you had a different armor as you progress through the, the game. And I also wanted to have a quest system where there was teleportation, and moving walls and that sort of thing, making it a more advanced style game. I'd never seen any of these types of features in an 8K game, and so that was part of the challenge was how far and how advanced could I make the actual gameplay. So I'm on the title screen, and I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next, and this will start the game to actually loading. And so I'm going to press any key. This is just telling you all the different keys that you use and a little bit of background of this project as a whole. And this should load at about 2 minutes 40 seconds or so. I knew I was pushing the limit for an 8K system trying to make a full featured game. Obviously this can't compete because it's only 8K with something like Ultima. Uh, Ultima 1 is what I'm talking about. It, it can't compete with that, and it can't compete with something like Secret of Mana. But I wanted some of those concepts from these more advanced games in an 8K game. Had I actually seen a game that was adva as advanced in the late 70s as this game is on the Commodore PET, uh, the, the game that I built here, I would have short-circuited because there just wasn't anything that was even a close second to this. And hopefully my tour of previous games or games of the era kind of shows that. Okay, so let's go kill some monsters. You already see one monster. It's a burn ban in screen. He's got one health and I'm gonna move down. Notice that there is that snow just like the other games. Uh, and it's tied to the slow refresh rate with the with the RAM and the interaction with the display. And it looks like I'm fighting an ooze now, and I just leveled. You start out at level zero, and level zero only requires two kills to advance to level one. It's kind of an intro to the system. So I can move at a fairly quick pace, as you can see here, and I can move around. And let me see, I'm gonna go ahead and do a search for secret doors. You'd think I know where they were. And with level one, this is an intro level, so I'm not worried I'm giving anything away. Looks like there's a cave lurker somewhere around that has two health, and I'm gonna go ahead and attack him. And I got a new weapon, that's great. I now have an attack of eight rather than six. So we're gonna continue on. Wow, another secret door. It was like I knew exactly where it was. We're gonna go over here. And I'm going to search for some random reason here. When you search for secret doors, it searches the entire area that's displayed on the screen that is not veiled in dots. Okay, so I'm going down here. When I entered the game, it said something to the effect of a dream led you to this place. So that's the start of the storyline uh, for this game. And now I'm traversing deep into the dungeon. Let me go ahead and go to the map so you can see as you explore it uncovers more of the map. I'm currently at this position and you can see the entire level as it, it currently uh, has been unveiled. Now when you switch levels the fog of war is reset. So if you switch levels and then you go back to your original level the fog of war is reset and also the monsters are. So in that case, uh, case it's kind of like Secret of Mana. You get that kind of reset. Ooh, a whole bunch of gold and some object over here. Wonder what those are. So I'm going to loot the gold. And unfortunately, I didn't get an armor upgrade. Gold is the only place that you can get armor upgrades. And I got a quest progression. Like your dream, a lady is carved in crystal. 
So basically when you get that quest element, it does unlock a certain area on level one. And we're gonna go over there now. Ooh, look at that, a trapper. I'm down to one health, I don't think I'm gonna live. Wow, I killed it. I don't know how I survived that. I have one health. Um, I got very lucky. So we're going to go up this way. And I want to show you, okay, that with, with this game, I've made it where the only penalty that you have for dying is you end up resetting back to your spawn point for that level. So I'm going to make myself die here. Okay, Mutant will definitely kill me. He's got 12 health, I got one. So let's go ahead and do an attack here. Oh no, I died. So the Mutant, if he had taken damage, it would be reset back to 12 too. So I'm at 25 and he's back down at uh, 12 health. So I'm gonna go back down here and rather than going to find the Mutant, I am going to beeline uh, towards the next level exit. And again, I don't think that I'm giving away anything because this is an intro level anyway. I highly recommend exploring all of level one, mainly for experience and getting levels so that you know how to play. So there's level two right there. There's the stairs down. So basically notice that when I hit the stairs, I now have two options for level one and two. So I can go freely now between the, the new level and the old level that are unlocked. I don't even have to be on these stairs. I can be in the original stairs where you start the game. So I'm going to press 2 and this is going to start it loading. First it loads a level 2 text screen, which I'll call a cutscene because it's very similar. While this is loading, keep in mind that the take cassette is a fairly slow device, but you only have 8K of memory. So it's all relative to us. This did not seem that slow for an 8K system. And it was exciting waiting for those load times and for it to actually complete that load where, where you were able to play the game. That was part of the enjoyment of the actual gameplay. Okay, so it has loaded the cutscene. Real exciting cutscene here, huh? Compared to today's cutscenes, but for an 8K system, this would have blown us away. I don't even think that there was any games at this time uh, with any type of cutscene or loading, multiple loading, or the ability for you to even save and reload a game. So these are all advanced concepts. Obviously, I threw as much as I could into this game. So basically, it takes tells the next progression. This gives you kind of continuation of the plot that we've already seen. And I'm going to go ahead and continue the loading. And 48 seconds later, you actually see the, the game's loaded level two, and it has its own set of new monsters with different graphics for each of those graphics. Uh, that includes the doors, the hallways, everything is different graphics for each level. So I can go ahead and explore this level. Obviously, I don't want to start giving away too much of the game. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop. But you've had a great demonstration of how much I've tried to throw into this game. I'm sure you're wondering at this point, how can you get a copy of this game and how can you possibly play it? Not everyone has a 8K Commodore pet lying around. Uh, there's an excellent emulator called Vice that can play as any of the Commodore pets. And that would give you the full experience, including the audio and that sort of thing. A lot of people seem to have trouble getting it set up and configured. I'm going to provide links so that you can see how to get it installed on your system, as well as ideal command line parameters to run the actual game. And then there is a second way that you can do this, and that is online, which I'll also provide links for. I have worked with Norbert Landsteiner. He has made upgrades to an emulator that was originally written by Tom Skibo, and then Norbert Landsteiner took those and made a lot of modifications to that original code. And I really appreciate Norbert's hard work. T 
to get my game working with the tight memory constraints of an 8K game. There was some issues with emulating a disk drive uh, where there was some buffer overflow after loading the dungeon levels and the, and the t screen text. And he worked with me and we got them solved. Uh, so I certainly appreciate that. And the online version is just excellent. The only detriment with the online version is that you don't have audio. There is no audio currently. He's planning to implement audio, but at this time it's not there. His emulation has just uh, been a, an excellent testing tool for me. And I've had a couple of tester users that have used it as well. Um, as far as downloading the game and that sort of thing, I'm still currently testing and working a few bugs out and that sort of thing, but expect something up shortly. I'll provide a link for the actual download and I'll probably make it as shareware. I'd certainly appreciate that uh, more than anything else motivates me to continue making videos like this and that sort of thing. And that pretty much covers everything uh, for both the restoration of this Commodore pet as well as me creating the game. If you're wondering about the timeline that it took, six months ago I started the restoration on this of this pet. It took about three months. And three months ago I started working on the actual game. So three months start to finish part-time effort. Uh, you know, I have a day job, but this was a part-time hobby on weekends and, and that sort of thing.